and whether it's a Cool remodel or a new build, you know, both parties, myself included, gets excited about the possibilities. And sometimes you have to look past that and be like, all right, you know, the, do the personalities match, do the, the budgets match, do the time front timelines match? And that way, you know, for everybody involved, it's a decent project. Welcome to the Fine Home Building Pro Talk Podcast, a regular discussion with building industry professionals. This is senior editor Patrick McComb. Today I'm joined by builder and remodeler Jason Kerrer. You can find the Fine Home Building Pro Talk podcast and the original Fine Home Building podcast at finehomebuilding.com slash podcast. You can ask questions and leave feedback there too. First off, Jason, did I say your last name correctly? Is it Kerrer? You did. I'm, I'm actually impressed. That's usually <laughs> a, a tricky one. I usually ask folks ahead of the show and uh, I, I forgot to, so I apologize, but at least I got it right. Well done. Can you tell me what you uh, do for a living? Uh, I own a company in down East Maine region called Pine State Builders. Uh, We do uh, general contracting, new construction, remodeling, and uh, we found a small niche of sorts doing uh, historical restoration work as well. And uh, how did you get into this business and when did it start? Uh, I started the business uh, almost three years ago now. well, I moved to Maine about six years ago, um, worked for a couple different companies, builders around here, and then went out on my own. Um, got into it. Uh, basically, it's kind of a, a rural area where there's not a lot of uh, career opportunities. So kind of making your own is a, a good way to do it. And um, kind of always had the ambition to to want to have my own company, have a, a you know some entrepreneurial spirit to kind of create something and, and build something and see how it goes. How did you learn the, the, the building part of it? Um, well, uh, I don't ever claim to be a, a carpenter necessarily. I feel like it takes away the people that have dedicated their whole lives to it. Um, I've been doing it for a little while. Uh, I went to college for construction management and have held other, you know, through college and um, after college, you know, jobs doing carpentry or laboring, doing different things in the industry, such as you know, site work and concrete work and things like that. Do you get to do uh, hands-on stuff, or are you running a business most of the time? Um, a lot more hands-on, and starting to kind of transition to being able to run the business as we grow and we get you know more complicated projects and you know more demanding schedules and um, more people involved that you know requires a little more oversight. Uh, we came to know each other because you wrote to the regular podcast saying you were having. Uh, difficulty finding uh, help, like a lot of folks. Can you talk a little bit about that? Yeah, uh, yeah. I feel like uh, it seems like everybody around the industry seems to have that challenge with the uh, you know the labor shortage or you know finding good reliable workers. And um, here is no different. Uh, where I'm located, the you know probably the the best paying, most consistent work is lobster fishing, um, and there's no real regulation there's no you know uh, license requirements inspections it's kind of the the wild west of out east Um, you mean in the construction industry i'm guessing there's probably lots of regulation of the lobster business yeah more more, i'd say more in that than the uh, the construction industry um so you know it's a kind of a, a microcosm of the area as far as finding good you know good help and uh you know i i started off i i you know had a truck and started doing smaller work, had, uh, had a guy on to help for a little while. He's, he was around for about two years. Um, but I always wanted to, you know, grow a team, grow a business. So if you put out a job listing, you, you network with other people, you ask your, you know, local, you know, lumber yards and suppliers of who's doing what. And, you know, if anyone's looking for a job to have them reach out. Um, and in a, I don't know, about a three-year span, I was able to build a fairly decent team. I have five employees right now, um, but it comes with, there's no, um, there's not a lot of people like, you know, coming out of trade school that's looking for work or actively looking. It's kind of the other way around where you the employers have, have to go digging for them. Yeah. And do you think uh, that has any potential to change? Is Maine, as an example, doing anything more to do uh, career education? Uh, I think it's got potential to change, um, and I think it's it's a I think it's a kind of a tr- tricky subject that I think to to have 
a better labor force and like diverse workforce that you almost need more regulation that brings up the professional nature of the industry. Um, I, I, in the last two years, the demand of work and projects have increased. So there seems to be more people, you know, looking for maybe those carpentry jobs that they can make a little more money than some other work and, you know, have year round work. And it's may probably, you know, I assume it's safer than being out on a lobster boat in January. Um, <laughs> Do folks lobster in January? I didn't know that. I believe so. I mean, I'm not much of a fisherman, but I know they lobster fish and and uh, get scallops and things like that. So it doesn't sound. And you like told me it was job to me one but. one degree this morning. So that kind of talks one about one degree. Yeah, yeah, yeah. That would be uncomfortable. <laughs> I think it's fair to say that most people don't get into the construction business because they like the business side. You might be an exception because you went to uh, construction management school. But mm -hmm. what made you want to start your own company and deal with the headaches of running a business? Um, it, yeah, it's, uh, I, I, I kind of the I'm, what am I? I'd be thirty four soon, and I was my high school career was no different. Where they kind of just pushed you to go to college, so um, I did that, and I did a semester of school in the Boston area and hated every day of it. So I dropped out um, and moved back home and, and got a job and uh, started working for a company in Connecticut where I'm from originally. And uh, that was kind of my first, you know, official exposure doing, uh, we did groundwork and concrete, uh, groundwork, concrete work, underground utilities type. And I was able to be just a laborer, but on, on some large projects and seeing all the moving parts that go into a project from you know, the guys digging the holes to the, the management side, the engineering, the electricians, the carpenters, you know, salespeople, everything involved. It's, you know, it's a pretty cool industry as a whole. There's a lot of moving parts. Um, so after a year of just staying home and working, I thought, well, you know, college doesn't seem so bad if I maybe go for something that I want to go for. And, and uh, so I went off to, to Michigan and pursued a construction management degree. Do you um, think your schooling adequately prepared you to run a business? Um, I think it helps. I think, you know, you get the, the safe environment of learning how to, you know, estimate. And, you know, uh, the program that I was a part of had some pretty cool, like, we'd get projects that were already done. So you get the big spec books and the drawings and you'd have essentially, you know, hey, it's an addition to a hospital. Like, you and your group are going to estimate and build this project. Um, so I feel like a good chunk of the schooling was, is helpful. You know, it gives you that safe background to learn with, you know, not necessarily costing you anything, but like anything else, you, you get into your own business and you still pay for those mistakes and, and things like that as, as you grow and learn and the bumps along the road. Sure. Uh, so what, what kind of projects are your sweet spot? Where, where do you like to see your business going and uh, what would you, what kind of stuff would you be doing uh, regularly? Uh, we've done, um, I, I like, you know, it's, it's kind of an odd mix. I, I like the historic restoration projects because it's always interesting to see how things were built and how you can, you know, either save an old property or, um, improve. Like we've done in the last two years, we restored a 200 year old house that was vacant for 12 years. These people bought it sight unseen. Um, we restored it in seven months and got them living in it full time. And there was trees growing out of it. It was a mess. Um, a current project we're on right now is converting a 160 year old brewery or 160 year old house into a restaurant and brewery. And I have a 260 year old house we're going to reassemble um, this coming this this year, probably this summer. But on How the flip does side one of that, learn? I'm sorry. I'd go ahead. Nope. I was, and then we have a couple of new builds on the schedule for this coming year as well. So it's kind of a diverse amount of work. How does one get trained to do historic work like that? I mean, th you didn't learn that in construction management school, I bet you. <laughs> no, no, it's, it's kind of trial by fire and, uh, and trying to do as much homework and research um, as we can, you know, try to do, you know, doing the, 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 the properties justice as far as, you know, remaking mill work, um, finding the right products that go with it and, you know, not, um, not ruining, you know, what was built, you know, it's, if we can, um, 
restore rather than replace everything that's that's helpful but you know a lot of these places have been neglected for so long you have a, a lot of rot repair and replacement to do but you know part of it is having enough time and the right budgets to be able to find the stuff you need to do right by the project but where i am there's a lot of old properties so it's it's you know it's a pretty high demand um you know line of work and I'm guessing, like in a lot of places, your recent clients are folks who are moving to uh, more rural areas because now they can work from anywhere. Is that true? That's true. Yeah, it's been a, a huge um, uh, influx of people and, you know, and uh, people, again, yeah, they work remotely or they don't need to be in a certain spot. You know, those the, that one house that we restored, the, they both work in Washington, D.C., well, remotely work in Washington, D.C., um, and I would say nearly all the products that I have on the books for this coming year is either people that are moving up here or second homes or think they want to move up here because it's the cost of living is fairly affordable. It's you have space. Um, there's been a push for improved internet up this way. So, um, people can have those remote jobs, tech jobs, or, you know, whatever they can do from a computer. In your experience, do they have a connection to the area previously, or are they moving there just because of the quality of life and the beautiful scenery and the uh, mild climate? Um, I, I think it's a mix of the, of the two. It seems like, um, like I said, I moved here from Connecticut, and I always I say that Maine's kind of a small, for a state, it's a small town. It seems like you somehow know somebody that knows somebody that's been here or done that. Um, it's a mix. Um We've even seen movement from people from just southern Maine in the Portland area that are coming the four hours up the coast because you, know, you it's get less more popular. for your money. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. You know, you can have you know oceanfront or lakefront property for you know a fraction of the cost. So, what are some of the challenges with building in this environment with COVID and supply chain issues and labor shortages? I, I mean, I mentioned some of them. Are there specific things that are challenging your company? I think like everyone else, it's the scheduling is the hardest part because of the, um, the unreal, uh, the unreliable lead times on materials, um, and that affects schedules. And if you're bringing in subcontractors, they're delayed because other projects are delayed. So I would say the last two years, the hardest part of anything is putting a schedule together and sticking to it the best you can. I mean, you try to, um, you know, manage client expectations and communicate, but you know, whether things make the truck that week or the truck's going, or if the whole place is shut down because all the drivers have COVID, that's, that's a true story from this past summer or, you know, um, so it's, um, it's, it's in a way it's kind of makes you have to work a little harder or be more uh, on top of it. So, you know, getting a project, getting those selections made, getting, you know, and ordering in advance, you know, I got a, a new house build and I've ordered, I ordered everything as soon as we signed the contract and I went and bought a shipping container to drop on site because I'm getting windows and doors before I'm getting my, my wall sheathing and trusses. So, you know, you need places to put things in and I'd rather have the material waiting there for us than the other way around. Wow. That's really interesting. So are clients generally um, accepting of changes in schedule? Um, for the most part, I think if you can lay out the expectations and, um, you know, if anyone's, you know, if you watch the news or listen to the radio, I mean, it's not, you this know, isn't it's, a it's, surprise. It's, it's not a surprise <laughs> to anybody. Um, but everyone, you know, everyone in this industry knows that people want their, their project done and they want it done now and as quickly as possible and at a high, high level. So um, I'm still navigating that as far as managing the expectations, as far as the scheduling goes that, hey, I know we have the schedule lined up, but you know, the door that I was told was three weeks is now 14 weeks. You know, there's not, a, I, there's not a whole lot I can do about that other than apologize and install it as soon as it gets in, you know. One of my uh, contributors pointed out to me recently that these uh, crazy lead times are stretching out project duration, which kills your overhead and profit. How are you, how are you dealing with that? I mean, uh, you, you, those costs are the same, no matter how many projects that you're get getting done. I, I think you'd agree. Yeah, it's. I, I think it's a. It's a definitely a challenge. I, what I've tried to do is, um, 
I mean, for the products that we have coming up or the fund up, it's I've taken a, a larger deposit from the, the clients to be able to pretty much order everything. So, hey, if we, we sign up now, I'm going to order everything. We may not step foot on that job site for four months or longer, but by the time we get there, we're going to have most of the materials there and ready. Um, we have a remodel project and the windows are 23 weeks out. They want to be in by the springtime. It's like we might, we probably we won't even get to it by then, mm. you know, by the time they got through their selections and the contract. So yeah, I think it's, I don't know. I, I, it's, I think it's definitely a challenge. I, I've been trying, you know, the, the, the plan for us moving forward is to do, try to do just one project at a time and just stay super focused and ahead of it. So, you know, I can stay ahead on the next one, getting things ordered, but we're not bouncing around because it's not good or profitable for anybody when these projects drag on and on and on, you know, homeowners become unhappy and, and, you know, the crew doesn't like bouncing around from project to project. And, and, you know, it's not, it's not a good situation for anybody. I think when clients have uh, a disappointment or a frustration with a project, it's hard to go back the other way. It's hard to get them uh, to, to be excited and pleased. It, it's just one setback after another once they seem to be disappointed. Yeah. And I think everyone kind of expects to have that, you know, Hey, the project's done. Big reveal. It was real fun. Everyone's hugging it out and had a great time. And the reality, I mean, yeah, you get those, and it's nice when it happens. But you know, a handful of delays, whether they're within, within or not in your control, you know, can really put a a damper on the project. Where it just yeah. all right, let's get it done and get out of here, which is unfortunate. It is because it <laughs> it's not your fault. Uh, are your trade partners, your subcontractors and other uh, relationships in the industry, are they having similar challenges with getting stuff? Uh, Ian Schwan, who's a regular uh, podcast, regular uh, podcast host on the Fine Home Building podcast, was talking about meter sockets as an example. Is it weird stuff like that, too, in your experience? It is. Um, for example, like, yeah, meat. Uh, meter sockets, like I had a couple projects trying to get temporary power on, and it's like, oh, we get it in three months, and it's like, well, oh, I guess I don't need the power right now, I guess. And and I use most of the same, um, you know, trade partners, same plumber, electricians on most of my projects. Um, so I give them, you know, they know what my schedule is, you know, pretty much speeding at the air. I said, hey, this is what's on the schedule. We'll iron this out, but if we can get these things lined up, and it's it's odd things like it was, you know, for a little while it was getting. Uh, electrical boxes, old work boxes were impossible to get um, for some remodeling projects. Or um, I was talking to my spray foam contractor yesterday, and you know he's he's trying to buy so much in advance because he keeps getting told that the supply is dwindling. So he's just pretty much spending everything he's got to load his truck so he can keep working and keep schedules you know somewhat in line. Does the spray so foam company give him an explanation what the heck's going on? Not that I, not that he could explain to me. I, I just kind of assume that it's either I don't know if it's a demand thing or you know I, I production, I know, like production. Yeah. You know, it's it's odd items. It's not, you think it's you know you kind of get used to the special order items taking longer and having to have you know longer lead times or harder to get, and it's you know. Work boxes is a shock to me, right? Because yeah. you go in the home center and there's thousands of them in every home center at least there used to be i haven't worked right. in a while maybe i should buy them all up jason and yeah, send them you to you. Good investment. <laughs> well and, and to, to a little bit for us up here is our, like the closest home center to us you know big box store is two hours you know there's no home depot or lowe's or anything like that nearby it's you're driving two hours to one of them you know four hour round trip to go get some old work boxes seems so how far no. away is your electrical supplier as an example in your lumber yard? Um, lumber yard, there's, there's actually two in our town, um, decent chain lumber, um, you know, lumber chains. Um, and then there's a couple of electrical supply, but a lot of, a lot of our stuff comes out of Bangor, which is two hours away, you know, one way. So, so it depends on when the trucks run, you know, they usually come maybe twice a week to, to the, the down East, the area, the, you know, to our, our part of Maine. So. Do you think, I mean, you mentioned it earlier that there's an influx of people who now can move to rural areas. Has it made it easier to get clients? And just because there's a lot of clients doesn't mean they're a good fit for your company. How do you make sure that 
you want to work with this person or couple? Yeah, it seems like it, it's definitely increased the demand of work. You know, the you you kind of think with the 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 prices of materials being so unreliable and fluctuating all over the place that that work would kind of slow down or people would be more cautious. But it just seems like the more people move in, the more they want to do, whether it's a renovation on their home, you know, they found this great property, this dilapidated house they want to save, or, you know, they got a piece of land and they want to build something. Um, the, the screening part of the client is still kind of a work in progress, you know, because everyone, you try to implement your systems and, you know, everyone's excited at first, you know, it's a new project. It's, you know, whether it's a cool remodel or a new build, you know, both parties, myself included, gets excited about the possibilities. And sometimes you have to look past that and be like, all right, you know, the, do the personalities match, do the, the budgets match, do the time front, timelines match. And that way, you know, for everybody involved, it's a decent project, but that's still, for me anyway, it's still a, a work in progress, that whole screening process. Um, Are there any red flags you have or have you heard from your colleagues that, you know, don't work with that person? Yeah. Yeah. I mean, that like anywhere else, you get some of those people like, oh, you don't want to work for that person here. They don't, that's, they do this or that. Um, a lot of mine is if, if they're not respectful of, you know, the kind of the time frame, or if they're really hiding their budget, you know, where I'm, I'm not asking them to give me down you know, to a, to a, to a, you know, a cent of what their budget is, but you know, I've gotten a few phone calls where, you know, someone bought a lot and they want to see if they can build a whole house for $60,000. And I'm like, I'm sorry, but that's, it's not going to work. I, it's not going to work. And uh, you don't, you try not to offend anybody, but you know, you have to screen those out or, you know, the project starts with, you know, they have a really, you know, they're, they're talking with, you know, a real big budget. And when it gets down to it, they don't want to spend that much. And then they're disappointed on what they can get for what they want to spend. So it's, it's a, it's still a, a work in progress for me as far as, as ironing out those details or screening clients and deciding what projects to take on. I don't envy you. It seems challenging, right? It's, it's, it's I think it's, it's still fun though. It's, it is a challenge though. Yeah. Uh, and having the right clients, I think is a key to success. I, I think you'd agree folks who can pay the bills are willing to pay the bills and are, you know, reasonable to get along with. You mentioned in their email that the uh, loss of uh, career education, industrial arts programs in schools, uh, young people are, might be interested in building and uh, would, might never know that they might be interested in building because they've never been exposed to it. What, what do you see as the solution to that? Um, well, I think, I mean, I think a, something that could be helping the cause a little bit is the outrageous cost of college now. I um, mean, it's constantly growing. So that's that could be a deterring factor. And you don't necessarily want people to you know, settle and say, hey, this is second best thing. I guess I'll do this for the rest of my life. But um, it's, I don't know, it's, it's, I think it's different in every state, but it seems like, you know, there's no, there's very few, you know, technical high schools that are doing, you know, building trades. Um, and I think it's, you know, I've, I haven't been in school in a long time, but I don't, I assume they're probably still trying to push everyone to go to college, like, hey, go to college and then figure it out, go accrue you know, this amount of debt and then figure out what you might, may or may not want to do. Um, and I don't think that's necessarily the answer, you know, I, at the very least, I think they should encourage people, you know, to join the trade, even if you don't want to do it for a living, it's, it's pretty good to be able to do some stuff for yourself. Sure. You know, you got a home repair or, you know, auto repair or something like that to be able to not have to be, you know, at the mercy of somebody else to come do something for you is, is helpful. Um, and I can only really base on what my experience was, and I, I was having this conversation yesterday, actually, with one of my uh, my plumber, is the, when I was in middle school, we had the opportunity to choose between, like, the public high school, a private school, a tech school, and uh, like, I think it was a Catholic school, and it was, you're, whatever, 12, 13 years old, and they kind of expect you to make this decision, like, it's going to affect the rest of your life, and I just, I recall, you know, they said, if you went to a the technical school, you couldn't go to college. And I was like, oh, well, well, I might want to go to college. So I guess I shouldn't do that. And, you know, in hindsight, it's, you know, you could have gone and you, you spent four years immersed in, you know, your general studies in, you know, whatever program, carpentry, electrical, automotive, and then maybe come out and you want to pursue being a carpenter or you can go off and go get a degree somewhere or whatever you want to do. But it seems like those options are, 
few and far between. And you're kind of asking kids to make these life decisions that, you know, aren't necessarily what they want to do, you know, a couple of years down the road. It's a good point. I talked to so many people who've come to construction, uh, later and it was because it was a summer job or a you know college break or whatever or a habitat trip and they decided that wow this is amazing i want to want to do this and i i think we're not serving young people if we don't give them choices right it's and i don't i mean yeah i think pushing everyone to college is i wouldn't necessarily discourage people to go off and further education but i don't think you necessarily have to run off right away i think it's okay to you know learn something, a, a hands-on skill or a trade. And then hey, maybe, maybe a couple of years down the road, you want to go to college and you can pay for it because you're still working and taking classes and producing something that you can be proud of. Did you have, uh, folks who introduced you to construction or, uh, you know, an interest in construction when you were growing up? Um, not really. Uh, I grew up in a, a, a Navy household and a house that was always under some sort of project. So I guess that was kind of my introduction and, as a kid, I never liked it because it was always the weekends Disruptive. were doing something yeah. and it's, it wasn't that much fun. Um, but I've always enjoyed working. Like we, you know, if my whole family has been kind of more of a, you know, a do it yourself type people, you know, fix things instead of replacing them. Or, you know, I don't recall ever seeing a contractor like at my house growing up. Um, but I didn't really get interested in it, like until I, I went away to school and then came back and started working into it. That was really, so I was probably, you know, 18 years old, really like, Hey, this is, this is very interesting. You know, it's, it kind of has all the components of, you know, hands-on work or, you know, applying things you can learn in school and cool things that, you know, cool equipment, you know, all sorts of neat tools and stuff that are you know involved in the, in the trades. Um, but yeah, it wasn't necessarily like I, I didn't grow up, you know, in a, you know, with a bunch of carpenters around me that, you know, building houses and things like that. It was, you know, small repairs in our own house or remodeling projects or, you know, fixing, you know, working at other family members' houses when we're on vacation or something like that. You know, it was, it was never, it wasn't really a formal introduction, I'd say. Did you have access to tools and stuff to play around with? with and did you take advantage of that? Uh, a little bit. I mean, I, I got into, um, you know, woodworking a little bit, like building really bad furniture as, as, you know, as a high school age kid or younger, you know, you had a couple saws and some pine boards and think you're going to build a great desk or something like that. And, you know, you're proud of it at the moment. Um, but yeah, we had some tools. My, my grandfather grew up as a kid, you know, he had a wood, a wood shop. So he was always, you know, very crafty making, you know, little odds and ends and things like that. Um, but uh, yeah, we had access to it. And like any other, I think, interested, interesting boy anyway, would, go tinker with something, take it apart, destroy it, you know, modify their, their Lincoln logs or their Hot Wheels cars or things like that to, to, to make something cool. So Agreed. So uh, do you own your own house now? Have you bought a place in super northern Maine, Jason? Yeah, well, technically it's down east Maine. People up in northern Maine are going to get offended because there's about because four Because you're on the coast. Of us. Yeah, it's, uh, forgive me. Uh, yeah. <laughs> no. Uh, yeah, so we, uh, my wife and I bought our house, um, I think just under four years ago now. Um, we moved out here, we rented a couple houses, and then we bought a, a, a house um, kind of uh, in between. My wife splits time between two, two different offices, so we're kind of in the middle of nowhere, in the middle of nowhere, um, which is nice. It's, it's got its perks. What's it um, like? What is it? It was built in, um, it was actually built in 2006. It's a, I describe it as kind of a craftsman style house it's uh it's it was built as a spec house in 2006 so i i, I kind of think it lacks a little character but we've been working on that over the last couple of years um but it's a it's a four bedroom house it's got a pretty small footprint which is nice um it's on a little lake so i can't complain about that but it's for my own doing it's always under construction so <laughs> is it enjoyable to work on your own place when you're running a construction company I don't enjoy it at all, actually. Um, I feel like if I could take like a month off and, and work on it, it's great. Or if a long weekend, you can really focus on, you know, the projects at hand. But I mean, we've been, we bought our house and I finished the basement and it took me like a year to do the basement. And we started renovating 
um, the second floor of our house, I remodeled the bathroom and put new hardwood floors and stuff in. And if I can get the rest of the hardwood floors in, um, it'll be just about a year to do all the flooring in the house. So it's <laughs> constantly living around demolition and, and boxes of materials and exposed walls and wires and plumbing because we're moving stuff. So it's, um, long story short, no, I don't particularly enjoy doing it on my own, uh, for my own house. Um, but it's nice to, it's nice to live in it when it's done, you know, you can be proud of what you did and, and it's, it's nice, but, um, the time for it is, has been tough, especially, you know, we haven't been in business for very long. So we're still, you know, I'm still in the, the pretty much having a tool belt done 35, 40 hours a week and running the business at night and in the weekends. And so it's been put on the back burner for a while. So things take a lot longer than they should. Is your wife patient with the projects around the house and your, you know, long work weeks running your business? Uh, yeah, for the most part. I mean, you can, you know, we all want it done. We're all tired of, you know, we got flooring boxes scattered throughout and, you know, we get, you know, dealing with the, the supply chain issues, you order stuff. And so now I have more boxes in the way of that. I got to move to do stuff, but, um, she also owns her own business as well. So she's understanding of the hours and, you know, the commitments outside of normal working hours. So what does she do? She is an optometrist. Um, and she became partner a couple of years ago. So uh, in a, her, in her a practice. Business. Yeah. Yep. So you now they stay busy. It's you know, they're for the area. They're the, the only optometry practice in the entire County. So they have a, a large patient base. What do you think the greatest challenges of living in a rural area? W w would you ever change? Would you, do you have any aspirations to move to the city at any point in your lifetime? Uh, no, I, um, the challenges are worth the, the, you know, quality of life and the, you know, the, uh, the things that you can have, you know, for the, if, for a materialistic uh, standpoint, the things that you can have because things are cheaper up here, land and houses and things like that. Um, you know, I'm from, Connecticut and I like, you know, Connecticut's a small state. And so I, I worked around cities and stuff there. We lived in um, Massachusetts for a couple of years when my wife was in optometry school, right in the downtown of the city. And uh, I didn't like that. I don't like the, um, it seems like the unnecessary stress of, you know, the hustle and bustle that people want out there. Um, but the challenge is here, you know, it's, it's supplies, it's, um, um, you go to different areas, uh, you know, where though I don't want to, I'm not trying to offend anybody, but like the work ethic is different. You know, it's not the most important thing. Everyone moves a little slower at times. So it takes an adjustment when you come from, you know, I was, I've, I worked for a builder in the Metro West Boston area for a little while. And it's hustle, 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 and, you know, hire and fire because people can't perform. And then you come out to a rural area where you have, you know, less trade associates, you have less suppliers, you can't be, you know, that as, aggressive. It's demanding. As, right. yeah, as, yeah. You're going to run out of help there pretty quick. So it's like, you have to have a little more patience and, and plan accordingly. And I've, I've found for me, you know, the products that go best, you know, I have, you know, if it's really well planned out, really well scheduled, and you can implement that schedule without, you know, stressing people out and, and, being overly demanding, those are the better projects to have. Um, but at the same time, communicating that to the people that aren't from around here that move out here and think that they can get things done like they could do in the city is also a challenge. Sure. So. They're used to a, a different pace. Yeah. Right. One of the things that, you know, I've lived in rural places and urban places uh, in my life. And one of the challenges I found was buying stuff, supplies, specifically for home building. Mm -hmm. And one of the things that's changed is uh, the prevalence of online uh, shopping. Uh, has that helped you? It has. Um, I mean, we have two lumber yards um, in, in our area. So you can buy you know, your cabinets and you can buy your framing materials and all that kind of stuff. Um, but it, it does kind of limit you as far as, you know, what products they carry, what vendors supply to them. Um, I've done quite a bit with just online shopping, whether it's, um, I use build.com quite a bit and I bought, you know, whole houses of hardwood flooring, bathtubs, you know, all sorts of stuff that you couldn't necessarily get locally. Um, and you can order it and it's going to come on an 18 wheeler and you just have to get it off the truck. And it's, 
it expands that reach a little bit as far as, you know, providing something different than what maybe, maybe what people are just used to be able to get when they go to you know, the local lumber yard and say, Hey, that, you know, that hardwood floor right there, that's what we can get. That's good enough. Or, you know, that bathtub, you know, maybe we wanted a more modern look. We wanted something different. Um, and I think between that and I think, you know, a lot of people come to us with, you know, Pinterest boards or Instagram things that, you know, Hey, we want this or that. And sometimes it's great. Sometimes you have to, you know, that kitchen was, you know, a $150,000 kitchen that's not in your budget. So, um, but it's good because I think it, it kind of helps expand, um, what people can do when you can get different products and, you know, you can kind of, you know, get people more what they want so they don't have to settle. And I think that makes for a better project too, when they can really get things that they, want not what they ha can get if that makes sense yeah sure um have you found build.com to be a reliable supplier have they delivered yeah so far um i've done stuff with my own house and a couple other projects and so far so good uh you know i live on a, a my only complaint is i live on a, a dirt road so the 18 wheeler doesn't come so i gotta meet him up on you know route one with a dump trailer or truck and load flooring and bathtubs and things like that but um, they've been reliable. Their customer service has been good and it's, it's been a good resource. It's, and it seems like their supply has been better. You know, you know, you need fixtures. You're not waiting 12 weeks to get a coal or faucet. You can get it in two. So it seems to be, it seems to be a good thing. I mean, it's, I, I, I know there's some risk of shopping online when you don't see and feel the product and you, but you know, a lot of times people want, you know, Hey, I want this finish and you can get that finish and you can get a quality product. They don't really necessarily care where it comes from. Is it possible to get samples from them? I mean, is that a service that they are for? Yeah. Yep. I got um, a bunch of like hardwood flooring and things like that from them. Um, and yeah, they seem, you know, they'll send you sections of, of things and then, you know, it so far so good, or I've even contacted some dealers directly, um, to, to get samples, if even if it's not getting through that website or if I had to order it through a different avenue, if you contact some of the suppliers directly, they'll send, you know, those samples of, um, you know, some siding samples and things like that for exploring some new products that aren't necessarily commonly used in this area. Hmm. So uh, any projects on the horizon for your own place besides the finishing the hardwood flooring? What's after that? Uh, well, our... our, our Second floor is almost done. Some some doors and some trim work, and I got to do a stair railing. And then our first floor is kind of a uh, we're knocking out some walls to kind of create the a little more open space. But it'll be a kitchen and a laundry room. So that's that's what's on the horizon. I'm hoping to get everything done by before the summer, and then take the summer off of home improvement projects for myself. <laughs> we'll see, we'll see how that goes, but <laughs> that's the plan. It's been a you know between regular projects and house projects like hey it's uh be nice to have a little bit of a break but sure um, it's been a pleasure talking to you is there anything you want to ask or tell our audience before we go no i mean not i mean not that i'm gonna you know preach to anybody but i know we spoke earlier and it was about you know the employees and, and getting good help and you know granted you know i haven't been in business for very long but i think it's important for people that are employing other people you know, to, to truly care and invest in them and, and whether that's paying them as much as you, as you can, or, you know, helping them grow professionally. And, you know, as, if they're growing professionally and if they're growing personally and they're compensated, well, they're going to be loyal. They're going to be, you know, um, reliable. And so far with my small team, that's what I've tried to do. And, you know, I, I have no complaints about that. And I know it's, it's tricky because you have to meet margins and you have to, you know, hit budgets and everything, but, um, I feel like, uh, you can't complain about bad help if you're not helping, you're not them. trying to <laughs> help them be good help. That means, you know. Well so, said. Anything else? No, I think that's it. I just, you know, I appreciate you guys having me on here. It's uh, my first podcast I've done. It's, it's a good time. It was a pleasure, Jason. Well, Thank unfortunately, you. that is all the time we have for today. Thanks to Jason Kerr and thanks to Thanks to Jason Kerr for joining us, and thanks to all of you for listening. Please remember to send us your comments, questions, and suggestions to fhbpodcast at taunton.com. 
And please like, comment, or review us however listening. It helps other folks find our podcast. Jason, it was a pleasure. Thanks for being on the show. Thanks, Patrick. Appreciate it. It was great, man. Bye, everybody. Stay safe. Keep craft alive. <laughs>